for those that uh, are not identified with Jesse, uh, we I think you can display. We we are uh, an information and communication technology association organization. Uh, today we represent more than 30 big corporations worldwide. Uh, as I said also before, it is important to to emphasize that we have uh, a couple of partnerships which they are displayed here with the, the ITU, it's one important one. Uh, actually, we have the ITU uh, also in, in relation to the, to the COP17 activities. We, we started a coalition, which is called the ICT Coalition, uh, and Jesse is the private sector promoter of this coalition together with the ITU, the UNFCCC, and uh, the UN Global Compact. And um, yeah, in, in addition to that, we have a couple of other organizations which are, have been joining uh, Jesse in different activities. Uh, I think Jesse became quite well known due to the Smart 2020 report, uh, enabling a low-carbon economy in the information age. Uh, this was an independent report which was launched in 2008. Uh, it was done by McKinsey and it was done with the support of the of the, um, an NGO based in London uh, to ensure the independence of, of the work. So the Jesse members only provided input to the report. We had no influence whatsoever in the, in the results of the report. Um, but the report showed that the, the ICT sector has a huge potential to reduce carbon emissions. So 15% uh, of, the, of the problem could be solved through ICT serv services and solutions. And in addition to that, by 2020, we could generate a benefit of 600 billion uh, euros. Uh, just la last year in Germany, it came, came out a report from one German bank say, saying that the 7.8 gigatons of CO2 that the ICT sector could reduce would represent last year 3 trillion, 3 trillion US dollars. So no longer the 600 billion that we calculated by that time. And this shows really how relevant this study is. And this study is now being used by all over the world. It's, it's an amazing su success story. And is part of uh, um, now of well, different presentations that, uh, as I'm doing here, but also is, is being used by acad academia and the governments to, to, to develop policy and, and so on. Uh, more importantly is that we now recognize that these uh, results could lead also to job creation. And uh, again, McKinsey using the Smart 2020 results. Last year at the World Economic Forum uh, came up with a report saying that these 7.8 gigatons of CO2 so could generate also seven, uh, 15 million jobs uh, worldwide. Uh, one study that is coming this year in Spain uh, shows that only in Spain around 300,000 jobs can be created in the next 10 years. Again through smart solutions um, and services. So bearing this in mind, I think that we, we cannot ignore these, these potentials. And we need to realize them now and fast. Uh, we are now in a time of that everybody is talking about the financial crisis. To some extent, the climate change discussion uh, is, uh, is being hidden by the financial crisis discussions. Uh, and uh, many are talking about the problem yet. And uh, just this morning today, in the ministerial meeting, it, it was only the problem that has been outspoken there, not the solution. And that cannot be. So we, we need to, to speak with the politicians and tell them, look, you have here an, an opportunity. But this is a very long way and a very difficult way. But it, it needs to be undertaken by someone. And I think Jess is in a position to, to make that happen. And um, we need to strongly spell out in all directions, wh what the ICT sector can do uh, to make this world more sustainable uh, and also to generate uh, job creation and growth. Uh, it's clear to us that in this regard, of course, the policymakers uh, can do much more than they have been doing so far. And uh, there is a need for a call in that direction. Uh, we are now working uh, with the other stakeholders to turn this potential into a reality. Uh, this is a long way, as I said. Um, we took an excellent first step in putting ICT on the global climate change agenda last year during the COP16 in Cancun with the launch of the Guadalajara ICT declaration for transformative solutions. Uh, by that time, over 40 stakeholders 
representing more than uh, one trillion US dollars of revenue supported this declaration. And the declaration expressed the ICT sector's commitment to provide solutions for climate change and called on governments to embrace a new approach to creating a low carbon economy. Uh, the declaration also provided a solid basis for engaging with UN governments and other stakeholders in a public-private dialogue on climate change. And we have been moving the agenda on that direction. That's why I already mentioned our ICT coalition with the ITU. It must be said that other two UN organizations are inside, the UNFCCC and the UN Global Compact. So as we continue to raise awareness about the potentials of ICT in leading the way to a low carbon economy, we have created the benchmark uh, and the web platform that for the first time make it possible to compare policy approaches to the adoption of ICT solutions for climate change. And I will leave to Dennis Pamlin to present the low carbon ICT leadership and benchmark and the web platform in more detail. Uh, this JESSE's low carbon ICT leadership benchmark, as you will see, is more than a benchmark exercise. This is a new JESSE initiative uh, a call for action to governments to implement and deploy ICT transformative solutions and with that to support sustainable development in all its components and by that also ensuring long-term sustainable growth. Um, so um, we will have, as Elaine said, uh, the speakers. Uh, I would like to make you aware uh, also of another initiative that, that Jesse will launch at COP17 in Durban in cooperation with the uh, UNFCCC Secretariat. So Christiana Figueras will be at the launch of this, this initiative on the 5th of December in, in Durban, and uh, as well uh, a coalition of stakeholders, including the ITU and UN Global Compact. The initiative is called the Transformative Step of the Day and consists on an award that will be announced every day during the second week of the climate change negotiations. The award will recognize leading government initiatives and other activities in support of low carbon ICT solutions. Nominations and voting will be facilitated through a mobile app application, which development was, uh, uh, well, supported by two Jesse members, Dosha Telecom and Ericsson, as well as a dedicated web platform. So I would like to encourage you to participate in determining which initiative deserves to be awarded uh, with the transformative step of the day in Durban. This will be uh, publicized, communicated, so I hope that we can all um, come together and make sure that the ICT sector will have uh, uh, its role. It will be playing the role that it deserves in the context of the global climate change, uh, not only in Durban, but uh, onwards in other in, uh, COP uh, events. Um, that will take place at the later stage. So thank you very much. Yes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this web platform um, and the strategy benchmark that we now uh, put together. And it builds on what uh, Lewis and Elaine has been talking about, that we are in this uh, situation now that we have established there is a lot of opportunities, but the way we organize today is usually not very good for implementing these solutions. So what we wanted to do is to see where are now governments when it comes to actually doing things, to putting the policies together that allow these solutions to be, uh, become more than ideas, but actually become reality. And I just wanted to start with one graph that I think is very important. Um, this shows that for each industrial change, you have an initial time of investment and then you start to really deploy this technology. And this is very important because a lot of the things that we are talking about, teleworking, mobile money, etc., has been talked about for a very, very long time. But we're now in a situation, only the, few, uh, the last few years, when we can see really strong and rapid uptake of this. You know, e-books have been talked about for decades. But it's only last year when Amazon.com sold more e-books than ordinary books. We've been talking about smart e-cars for a long time, but it's electric cars is now taking off and making demands for smart grids much bigger. So we see this transformation now that ICT used to make old industry slightly smarter. 
Now it's new solutions coming out to the market. But we're still in the very beginning. So understand who's leading this is very important. So the objective of this work was to see how can we create this kind of benchmark for government performance? And how can we analyze and assess the state of play among governments? Because we wanted to create a transformative and transparent situation. And when we went out to governments and asked, what did they want? The first thing they said, don't give us another top 10 list that will be go out in the media and then it's gone again. We want something that is dynamic and demand driven because we see so many people coming up with things and it's just a short term PR exercise. So what we want is total transparency. So we wanted to create a benchmark and a framework that where all the assumption, all the weighting, all the data is available. So it's nothing hidden. You can download everything. You can look at how everything's been calculated. It should be easy to visualize. We don't want 350 pages. We want something where it's easy to see who's leading and who's not leading. And maybe one of the most important things that people said was, I want to decide what I want to look at. I want to have tailor-made views on leadership. You can give an indication of what is the general picture, but then I want to be changed the weighting. If, if I think teleworking is more important than smart grids in terms of leadership, how will the weighting and ranking change? So we wanted to include that. I want to be able to choose a specific group of companies or countries to compare. It's very nice if you show some uh, top countries, but if my country is not there, it might not help me. Uh, I want to be able to use specific factors of reference. Maybe if I'm a poor country, my GDP is low, so maybe I want to compare with countries with similar GDP. Or maybe I'm interested in others having similar innovation system. Let's choose then that as a reference point. And then, of course, I'm, uh, as a country representative, I might be interested in looking at my country. So this framework also allows you to select your country as a reference point and then show who's above and below you. And then we also wanted to create the possibility to compare different benchmarks with each other. So if I'm good in this, am I also good in that? Who's good in both, etc. And then finally, and maybe the most difficult, how can we help to identify what's behind these countries' actions? What is the key data for different countries, including who's responsible? Because one of the challenges we have when collecting the data has been a really interesting exercise because sometimes that's with the Minister of Information Technology, sometimes Minister of Industry, sometimes Minister of Finance, sometimes Minister of Environment. It's, the responsibility for this is not uh, established yet. And that creates a, a, a really um, obst a significant obstacle for countries working with this because you don't know who to reach out to. So, and it's now up. So if you go in on Jesse's web page, I guess you have Jesse as a shortcut on all your web browsers and you check out the web page on a daily basis. Uh, if not, do that. And you will also see that the low carbon um, leadership benchmark is there. So if you were to click on that, like that, you will open up this benchmark. Uh, and you can download the latest benchmark here. And then if you scroll down, you can then see the graphic representations of the two uh, top 10 countries and this. But this is sort of the, the front end. So this is the, the results of the latest study. But if you're then interested in looking up again and you can click on compare countries here, then you get your little dashboard here. So you can select what kind of uh, studies you want to do, look at. You can uh, have advanced settings. And also if you scroll down on the page, you can choose if you want to zoom in somewhere. If you only want to look at the leaders, you can put on who's 50% or better or 75% or better. Uh, and then if we click on show advanced settings, you can then see what I talked about earlier. If you're interested, for instance, in these two studies now, you know, broadband integration and how countries have integrated ICT into the climate work, you can then see that you have smart grids, smart transportation, smart lifestyle, and then Let's see that you're interested then in smart transport so you weigh and innovation. So countries who've been looking into smart transportation and innovation, you want to look at them. You look at the Y option also, so both axes. Uh, so you have the same thing there. You focus on transport. Um, and then you, you say, I want to update the graph. So this is how it used to look like. And then you look at 
I'm only interested in transportation. Then you got a little bunch, and then of course you could choose to zoom in, or you can just show very simple the top list. And then you see, if you're interested in smart transportation innovation right now, Denmark, Germany, Hungary, Norway, and Portugal, and Sweden might be a good place to start. So this is how it works, so that you choose what you think is interesting, uh, and then you select whatever you want. And if we go, then go back um, and show advanced options again, you can also have a little bit of additional. If you want to, for instance, look at, okay, so here's the winners, but you want to have a third category, you can choose the size of the bubbles also as GDP or a third study. And then also this, you can select the countries. So you can show the top countries can be selected, who were the best in the world. You can choose a reference country, your own country maybe, and say, I want to see my country and those who are 10 above me and 10 below me. And then you can just say, well, maybe I'm just interested in Guatemala, Honduras, Germany, and Botswana. And then you click in those and you get the graph for that. Or you can use show, show uh, every country that is involved in this. And once you've done that, you might say, okay, I've found a couple of countries now that I find really interesting. And I saw Denmark was really interesting here, so I want to check what they have done. And then we have a long, long list where you can find information about who's responsible for this coordination, what documents do they have, what are the key policies that they have implemented, what are the targets they've set up, etc. Uh, so then, uh, it's, it's really about also facilitating meetings between these different countries so you can identify different leaders. And then for you who love data, we also made all the data available so you can really, I will not go into the details because this is all the messy thing when you really start looking at you know, num multiple data. You know, say that you wanted, for instance, to compare five different countries on six different data sets. Then you just choose that and you can just select the data and you get all this and you can download it and process it on an Excel file as well. And then if you want to know the underlying assumptions also for them, so all the different studies are then explained. What are the data that has been used? What is it behind that? And by that time you probably have a couple of ideas also that you won't say, I want this should be included in this uh, brilliant web page or uh, this study or this event should be um, uh, benchmarked, then you can click on your nomination. So you can say, I want to nominate this kind of document or this kind of event and say, why should this be do, uh, done in this way? Maybe next year you should have this ITU event. We should do a benchmark and see how many of the governments here that are participating are talking about these things and see you know, who's using that. Is that interesting? Or should we look at other kind of policies? You let us know, and we see what can be done. So, and I, so that's basically about trying to, to save the planet then, and realizing, I, I want to put this on because I think it's so important, because you who work with ICT are really sitting in the middle. Even if the governments are not really understanding the central point of um, this sort of this contraction point that we're shifting into this new society and people working with ICT needs to be put more in the center. Uh, I want to have this illustration because it talks about M Health, dematerialization services, M Government, M Learning. You know, it's Ministry of Health, it's Ministry of Education, it's Ministry of Energy. All these are going to depend very heavily on ICT. So you as ICT expert need to take a much more central role. And my last five minutes, I'll just spend briefly on this uh, low carbon ICT leadership benchmark that we did. Um, and you know, in that, you have total transparency in terms of what were we looking at, what was the weighting we were doing. So instead of just having this in a PDF format, you can then also use your uh, web browser, go in and change this weighting if you want to see another list. And what that showed was quite interestingly, uh, because it's, in, it's not a mature area, that countries are very different. So on this axis here, we have how well countries have integrated ICT into the environmental part. And on the other, um, the y-axis, you have how well they have integrated ICT into the broadbands or digital strategies. And you can see we have basically three clusters here. You have Ireland as, as being one who's really in the forefront of trying to see how they can use ICT in their environmental work. 
But then you have three countries, the Anglo-Saxon ones, the, the, um, Australia, uh, Great Britain, and um, United States. They, and especially United States, I think is very interesting because usually when you talk about United States, you think about them and climate is not very good. But they've actually done some really interesting thing when it comes to use broadband and ICT for accelerating smart economic development. And then you have in the middle, you have those who have done both. And Japan is a very interesting example. They are, I would say, in most cases, a few years ahead of most governments in terms of integrating this and making sure that these things are not just being done in one department, but a coordinating unit that is making sure that it's integrated elsewhere. But also Germany, Denmark, and the European Union are really in the forefront of really bringing this together. So I, I think we will see not one track towards smart ICT use, but in multiple tracks. And this, of course, depends very much on where the power within the government lies, individual people who are good at networking and making sure that things are implemented. And based on this, we have developed a, a bit of a framework that, you, that countries can use and look at depending on where you are. Some countries might not even have this still. And we think a first good step is to make sure that someone is responsible for looking into these things. Because if you don't have someone responsible, these things will happen ad hoc. Uh, and once you've got that, you, you might have some ad hoc, some ideas in terms of smart grids or smart transport. Usually there are some areas that countries are starting to look into. But ultimately, we really need to look at how ICT is integrated in all different parts of the economy. And it's a coherent uh, strategy. But as you might know, up in the uh, up left corner there, low carbon ICT is included in or supported by the broadband strategy. Because not all, way, all countries might have the broadband strategy and have all the climate in there. But if they don't have that, it needs to be supported of the other strategy that is somewhere else within the government. And that's where it's very, very important to make sure that there is such uh, a strategy and that the person who's responsible and working within the Ministry of ICT and looking at the broadband strategies have that connection and understanding. So the recommendations we have uh, are uh, five, uh, six. First one is just recognizing the role of low carbon ICT solutions in key policy areas. It's important for those working with ICT to just say that we need to start mentioning ICT when we talk about transport. It's not just about cars. It's also about teleworking. It's not just about making you know, fossil fuel plants a bit smarter. It's also looking into smart grids, the next generation, et cetera, et cetera. It's not an education and health, et cetera. Everywhere we need to make sure that ICT is inclu uh, included. You need to have a point person who's responsible for managing this policy of low carbon ICT. Uh, that will help you both in engaging internationally, but also with other stakeholders, and also within the government, that it's clear that it's someone who's actually uh, responsible for that. And then conducting, uh, as Lewis was talking about earlier, national studies that measure current emission savings for low carbon ICT. One problem with ICT is that it's too good. People don't do smart ICT solutions because they save ICT, uh, save climate. They do it because it saves money, it's increased productivity, etc. People use teleworking, video conferencing, smart control of buildings, not because primarily they are addressing climate ch uh, change issues, but because it makes economic sense and it's increased productivity. So we need to start acknowledging those solutions. It's not the, and so I have met so many companies and governments who talk about a solar panel somewhere and say this is our environmental in investment, while they have really smart ICT solutions that saves a lot more CO2, but they don't see that as a climate uh, strategy. They see that as a smart business strategy. And then um, setting emission reduction, em investment, and job creation targets. We should be very clear that ICT is very smart. It's not just done there because of the reduction potential, but it's creating green jobs, it's creating smart investment that increase innovation, etc. So how can we set these multiple targets for ICT? And also that all the different policy documents that are under development, not just the broadband strategies, but the different support for, you know, building standards, teleworking, smart grids, all these policy documents that are now under development, we need to make sure that ICT-relevant staff are participating in those. That is very seldom help happening today. And then finally, 
promote innovation and focus on transformative solutions in economic and ICT policies. One problem we've had so far is that climate policy have focused on 5 to 10 percent reductions. And usually ICT reductions are much greater. So therefore people have been talking about the car industry, how they can make cars a little bit smarter, and the power utilities, how they can emit a little bit less carbon. They not really looked into these significant big savings that ICT can do. This is about to change because oil prices and national security is kicking in now, and we're looking beyond Kyoto's, we're looking at deeper reductions. So this is really the time for ICT. Thank you. First, I'd like to uh, thank Jesse for inviting uh, the European Investment Bank for this session. Uh, we think it's uh, a very interesting topic, uh, and the bank is very much involved uh, and these uh, topics of environment. So uh, first of all, I'd like to present uh, the European Investment Bank, who we are. It's uh, the European Union's long-term lending bank. It was set up in 1958. And the owners of the bank are the EU countries. So we're a policy-driven bank owned by the EU. Uh, we're quite a large bank. We're actually the largest bank in the world with terms to lending volume. Uh, the total lending in 2010 was 72 billion euros, and about 12% uh, of that was outside the European Union. And as you can see in the lower part of the slide, about 30% of the loans that the European Investment Bank grants are for climate action activities. So for us, this is a level that we must keep, and we would like to grow it. So it's a very important area for the bank with climate action. I just want to show you a slide, the evolution of the bank's lending volume over the years. As you can see, it's been growing very much. And the peak is uh, with a financial crisis that we had 2008, 2009. Uh, we're aiming at lowering the loan volume. We don't believe that we will stay at the 80 billion that we reached in these years, but somewhere around perhaps 60, 65 billion per year going forward. So the European Investment Bank is a policy-driven bank. The policies are set by the European Commission. And within the European Union, we have six policy objectives that we follow, uh, one being cohesion and convergence, uh, the other one being small, medium-sized enterprises, environmental sustainability, knowledge economy, trans-European networks, sustainable, competitive, and secure energy. And outside the European Union, we assist the private sector development, infrastructure development, security of energy supply, environmental sustainability, and support for EU presence in Asia, Latin America with foreign direct investment. As you can see here, within these objectives that the bank has, both within and outside the European Union, we look at ICT and environment. ICT is within knowledge economy within Europe and in the infrastructure development outside the Union and uh, the environmental sustainability is uh, present in both uh, areas. So what strategy does the bank has with regards to ICT? For the moment, it's the Europe 2020 strategy, the digital agenda. And as you know, you might have read, there will be substantial amounts invested in broadband in the European Union in the coming years. Uh, but we also realize that half of the growth and the European productivity, productivity growth over the last 15 years has been driven by ICT, and we believe that this trend will accelerate, so it will be even more important. And that's why we see the importance of the broadband rollout. And this, of course, is not only for EU, this is wherever you would be in the world. And we also believe that the sector has to grow, because we cannot stop or cap the, uh, the sector, because if the sector stops to grow, we will also stop growing with regards to productivity, but also in RDI. And the European Union has a target of 3% RDI, R&D to GDP ratio. We're not even at 2% today. So again, ICT needs to grow. And uh, the bank wants to support ICT, of course, by financing the ICT research, the RDI. Uh, financing the deployment of infrastructure and uh, 
also want to focus investments on innovation that could be energy efficiency and the adoption of ICT in other sectors. So we cover the whole range from uh, sort of tangible assets to intangible assets, going from heavy broadband infrastructure investments to RDI and also to R&D, very sort of early stage of research and development. And we also take quite high risk when we invest in uh, or when we finance R&D. And I would say that most European major operators or um, vendors today in Europe, they have a, a relationship with EIB. And we also have quite long relationships because our loans are, tend to be quite long. And we also support small companies indirectly, either through loans going through other banks or uh, through the European Investment Fund, which is a member of the European Investment Bank group. And for projects with high risk, we have a product called Risk Sharing Finance Facility. And there you don't actually have to be um, um, investment grade. You can actually be below investment grade, but you, of course, the loans would be somewhere about, you know, 8 billion, or oh, sorry, 8 million to 200 million uh, euros. So it's still quite a high amount of loans, but it's something we want to do to promote uh, R&D. So a lot of talk of what we want to do, but I'd like to share with you what we have done. Over the last 10 years, we've signed 24 billion in loans to the ICT sector. About 50% has been to broadband, and uh, the rest has been divided uh, into R&D, which is about a quarter of the amount that we have uh, financed. And uh, of the broadband investments, about two-thirds is for fixed broadband and a third for mobile broadband. And this ratio, I mean, mobile broadband has come quite strong now in the later stage. But also with the digital agenda, we expect there to be quite a lot of fiber investments made in the EU. And in 2010, the ICT loans approvals, they reached two billion, roughly. And a quarter of this was uh, RDI focus uh, from the bank. And we like to focus on the R&D part of the um, activities that we have because we really, the EU cannot afford to fall behind the rest of the world with regards to R&D. And uh, we find it very important to invest at this stage. And this actually, in many cases, involved the energy efficiency uh, of products. So it's an area that we find uh, very important. And the way we work with our clients is that either a direct loan from the EIB to whoever wants to borrow money, the EIB would, together with a commercial bank, uh, lend to the customer. Or it could be a bank-guaranteed loan where we lend to the customer, but we also receive a guarantee from the house bank of the uh, client who wants to borrow money. Or we can use bank intermediated loans where we actually lend to a bank who in turn would uh, lend to a customer. And this would be where the loans would be smaller than 12 billion. Oh, sorry, 12 million. So we have different type of uh, solutions for that. And in order to borrow, there's also a cap on what the bank can do. We can only finance 50% of a project. Uh, and we only finance projects, so it's a project finance bank. So there has to be a well-defined project that we can finance. And uh, it's also important to emphasize that it is actually a commercial loan, it's not a grant. So the project that we finance has to be commercially viable and uh, whoever borrows money will have to be able to repay the loan to us. And the loan, the project also has to comply with the EU policy. And uh, for the borrower, they need to be bankable. So, or they could be, as I mentioned earlier, sub-investment grade, um, if we do this more risk-sharing uh, policy approach. So I think, what the bank, uh, it's a bit of what the bank uh, does, who we are. And uh, I think what's important um, 
when we work with this is that we want to increase the, the volume of our lending to the sector. But uh, what we see as well is that uh, the ICT sector is becoming more and more a target uh, on discussion with regards to carbon emissions. And as we saw earlier, we want 30% of our lending to be tied to climate change. So for us, in, o in order to be able to increase our lending to the ICT sector, the sector has to improve because we're moving towards a 3% of the global emissions coming from the ICT sector. And uh, the bank is very careful in financing sectors who are not regarded as uh, environmentally friendly. So, uh, and of course, for the ICT sector, I think it so far has been, uh, as Dennis was saying before, we've been focusing on so many good things you can do with ICT, it's nothing. No one has really seen, looked at the emissions that this sector is uh, contributing with. And I think there the importance is to show that, okay, the sector emits carbon, but it also enables a lot of other things. So I think the message is that uh, the bank promotes uh, investments in ICT, and we believe that it's a sector that has to grow in order for the EU to catch up with the R&D uh, ratio, as I mentioned before. But also outside the EU, we believe that for developmental purposes and uh, uh, for um, the FDI that we strongly support, uh, we also need to invest more in ICT. So I think, I hope I gave you a picture of who the bank is and how we want to work uh, in the ICT sector. And uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay.